Chapter 1 It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, mid-October, with the sun not shining and a look of hard wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit, with dark blue shirt, tie and display handkerchief, black brogues, black wool socks with dark blue clocks on them. I was neat, clean, shaved and sober, and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything the well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. The main hallway of the Sternwood place was two stories high. Over the entrance doors, which would have let in a troop of Indian elephants, there was a broad stained glass panel showing a knight in dark armor rescuing a lady who was tied to a tree and didn't have any clothes on but some very long and convenient hair. The knight had pushed the visor of his helmet back to be sociable, and he was fiddling with the knots on the ropes that tied the lady to the tree and not getting anywhere. I stood there and thought that if I lived in the house, I would sooner or later have to climb up there and help him. He didn't seem to be really trying. There were French doors at the back of the hall, beyond them a wide sweep of emerald grass to a white garage in front of which a slim dark young chauffeur in shiny black leggings was dusting a maroon Packard convertible. Beyond the garage were some decorative trees trimmed as carefully as poodle dogs. Beyond them a large greenhouse with a domed roof. Then more trees and beyond everything the solid, uneven, comfortable line of the foothills. On the east side of the hall a free staircase, tile paved, rose to a gallery with a wrought iron railing and another piece of stained glass romance. Large hard chairs with rounded red plush seats were backed into the vacant spaces of the wall roundabout. They didn't look as if anybody had ever sat in them. In the middle of the west wall there was a big empty fireplace with a brass screen and four hinged panels, and over the fireplace a marble mantel with cupids at the corners. Above the mantel there was a large oil portrait and above the portrait two bullet torn or moth-eaten cavalry pennants crossed in a glass frame. The portrait was a stiffly posed job of an officer in full regimentals of about the time of the Mexican War. The officer had a neat black imperial, black mustachios, hot hard coal black eyes and the general look of a man it would pay to get along with. I thought this might be General Sternwood's grandfather. It could hardly be the general himself, even though I had heard he was pretty far gone in years to have a couple of daughters still in the dangerous twenties. I was still staring at the hot black eyes when a door opened far back under the stairs. It wasn't the butler coming back. It was a girl. She was twenty or so, small and delicately put together, but she looked durable. She wore pale blue slacks and they looked well on her. She walked as if she were floating. Her hair was a fine tawny wave cut much shorter than the current fashion of page boy tresses curled in at the bottom. Her eyes were slate gray, 
and had almost no expression when they looked at me. She came over near me and smiled with her mouth and she had little sharp predatory teeth, as white as fresh orange pits and as shiny as porcelain. They glistened between her thin two taut lips. Her face lacked color and didn't look too healthy. Tall, aren't you? She said. I didn't mean to be. Her eyes rounded. She was puzzled. She was thinking. I could see, even on that short acquaintance, that thinking was always going to be a bother to her. Handsome too, she said. And I bet you know it. I grunted. What's your name? Riley, I said. Doghouse Riley. That's a funny name. She bit her lip and turned her head a little and looked at me along her eyes. Then she lowered her lashes until they almost cuddled her cheeks and slowly raised them again, like a theater curtain. I was to get to know that trick. That was supposed to make me roll over on my back with all four paws in the air. Are you a prize fighter? She asked, when I didn't. Not exactly. I'm a sleuth. A.A. she tossed her head angrily and the rich color of it glistened in the rather dim light of the big hall. You're making fun of me. Uh-uh. What? Get on with you, I said. You heard me. You didn't say anything. You're just a big tease. She put a thumb up and bit it. It was a curiously shaped thumb, thin and narrow like an extra finger, with no curve in the first joint. She bit it and sucked it slowly, turning it around in her mouth like a baby with a comforter. You're awfully tall, she said. Then she giggled with secret merriment. Then she turned her body slowly and lively, without lifting her feet. Her hands dropped limp at her sides. She tilted herself towards me on her toes. She fell straight back into my arms. I had to catch her or let her crack her head on the tessellated floor. I caught her under her arms and she went rubber-legged on me instantly. I had to hold her close to hold her up. When her head was against my chest she screwed it around and giggled at me. You're cute, she giggled. I'm cute too. I didn't say anything. So the butler chose that convenient moment to come back through the French doors and see me holding her. It didn't seem to bother him. He was a tall, thin, silver man, sixty or close to it or a little past it. He had blue eyes as remote as eyes could be. His skin was smooth and bright and he moved like a man with very sound muscles. He walked slowly across the floor towards us and the girl jerked away from me. She flashed across the room to the foot of the stairs and went up them like a deer. 
she was gone before I could draw a long breath and let it out. The butler said tonelessly, The general will see you now, Mr. Marlowe. I pushed my lower jaw up off my chest and nodded at him. Who was that? Miss Carmen Sternwood, sir. You ought to wean her. She looks old enough. He looked at me with grave politeness and repeated what he had said. Chapter 2 We went out at the French doors and along a smooth red flagged path that skirted the far aid of the lawn from the garage. The boyish looking chauffeur had a big black and chromium sedan out now and was dusting that. The path took us along to the side of the greenhouse and the butler opened a door for me and stood aside. It opened into a sort of vestibule that was about as warm as a slow oven. He came in after me, shut the outer door, opened an inner door and we went through that. Then it was really hot. The air was thick, wet, steamy and larded with the cloying smell of tropical orchids in bloom. The glass walls and roof were heavily misted and big drops of moisture splashed down on the plants. The light had an unreal greenish color, like light filtered through an aquarium tank. The plants filled the place a forest of them, with nasty meaty leaves and stalks like the newly washed fingers of dead men. They smelled as overpowering as boiling alcohol under a blanket. The butler did his best to get me through without being smacked in the face by the sodden leaves, and after a while we came to a clearing in the middle of the jungle under the domed roof. Here, in a space of hexagonal flags, an old red Turkish rug was laid down and on the rug was a wheelchair, and in the wheelchair an old and obviously dying man watched us come with black eyes from which all fire had died long ago, but which still had the cold black directness of the eyes in the portrait that hung above the mantel in the hail. The rest of his face was a leaden mask, with the bloodless lips and the sharp nose and the sunken temples and the outward turning earlobes of approaching dissolution. His long narrow body was wrapped, in that heat, in a traveling rug and a faded red bathrobe. His thin claw-like hands were folded loosely on the rug, purple nailed. A few locks of dry white hair clung to his scalp, like wild flowers fighting for life on a bare rock. The butler stood in front of him and said, This is Mr. Marlowe. General. The old man didn't move or speak, or even nod. He just looked at me lifelessly. The butler pushed a damp wicker chair against the backs of my legs and I sat down. He took my hat with a deft scoop. Then the old man dragged his voice up from the bottom of a well and said, Brandy, Norris. How do you like your brandy, sir? Any way at all, I said. The butler went away among the abominable plants. The general spoke again, slowly using his strength as carefully as an out-of-work show girl uses her last good pair of stockings. I used to like mine with champagne. 
the champagne as cold as Valley Forge and about a third of a glass of brandy beneath it. You may take your coat off, sir. It's too hot in here for a man with blood in his veins. I stood up and peeled off my coat and got a handkerchief out and mopped my face and neck and the backs of my wrists. St. Louis in August had nothing on that place. I sat down again and I felt automatically for a cigarette and then stopped. The old man caught the gesture and smiled faintly. You may smoke, sir. I like the smell of tobacco. I lit the cigarette and blew a lungful at him and he sniffed at him like a terrier at a ruth hole. The faint smile pulled at the shadowed corners of his mouth. A nice state of affairs when a man has to indulge his vices by proxy. He said dryly. You are looking at a very dull survival of a rather gaudy life, a cripple paralyzed in both legs and with only half of his lower belly. There's very little that I can eat and my sleep is so close to waking that it is hardly worth the name. I seem to exist largely on heat, like a newborn spider. And the orchids are an excuse for the heat. Do you like orchids? Not particularly, I said. The general half closed his eyes. They are nasty things. Their flesh is too much like the flesh of men. And their perfume has the rotten sweetness of a prostitute. I stared at him with my mouth open. The soft wet heat was like a pall around us. The old man nodded, as if his neck was afraid of the weight of his head. Then the butler came pushing back through the jungle with a tea wagon, mixed me a brandy and soda, swathed the copper ice bucket with a damp napkin and went away softly among the orchids. A door opened and shut behind the jungle. I sipped the drink. The old man licked his lips watching me, over and over again, drawing one lip slowly across the other with a funereal absorption, like an undertaker dry washing his hands. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlowe. I suppose I have a right to ask? Sure, but there's very little to tell. I'm 33 years old, went to college once and can still speak English if there's any demand for it. There isn't much in my trade. I worked for Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, as an investigator once. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Oles, called me and told me you wanted to see me. I'm unmarried because I don't like policemen's wives. And a little bit of a cynic, the old man smiled. You didn't like working for a while? I was fired. For insubordination. I test very high on insubordination, General. I always did myself, sir. I'm glad to hear it. What do you know about my family? I'm told you are a widower and have two young daughters, both pretty and both wild. One of them has been married three times, 
the last time to an ex-bootlogger who won in the trade by the name of Rusty Regan. That's all I heard, General. Did any of it strike you as peculiar? The Rusty Regan part, maybe. But I always got along with bootleggers myself. He smiled his faint economical smile. It seems I do too. I'm very fond of Rusty. A big curly-headed Irishman from Clonmel, with sad eyes and a smile as wide as Wilshire Boulevard. The first time I saw him I thought he might be what you were probably thinking he was, an adventurer who happened to get himself wrapped up in some velvet. You must have liked him, I said. You learn to talk the language. He put his thin bloodless hands under the edge of the rug. I put my cigarette stub out and finished my drink. He was the breath of life to me, while he lasted. He spent hours with me, sweating like a pig drinking brandy by the court and telling me stories of the Irish Revolution. He had been an officer in the IRA. He wasn't even legally in the United States. It was a ridiculous marriage of course, and it probably didn't last a month, as a marriage. I'm telling you the family secrets, Mr. Marlowe. They're still secrets, I said. What happened to him? The old man looked at me woodenly. He went away, a month ago. Abruptly, without a word to anyone. Without saying goodbye to me. That hurt a little, but he had been raised in a rough school. I'll hear from him one of these days. Meantime I am being blackmailed again. I said, again? He brought his hands from under the rug with a brown envelope in them. I should have been very sorry for anybody who tried to blackmail me while Rusty was around. A few months before he came, that is to say about nine or ten months ago, I paid a man named Joe Brody $5,000 to let my younger daughter Carmen alone. Ah, I said. He moved his thin white eyebrows. That means what? Nothing, I said. He went on staring at me, half frowning. Then he said, take this envelope and examine it. And help yourself to the brandy. I took the envelope off his knees and sat down with it again. I wiped off the palms of my hands and turned it around. It was addressed to General Guy Stemwood, 3765 Altabri Crescent, West Hollywood, California. The address was in ink, in the slanted printing engineer's use. The envelope was slit. I opened it up and took out a brown card and three slips of stiff paper. The card was of thin brown linen, printed in gold, Mr. Arthur Gwyn Geiger. No address. Very small in the lower left hand corner, rare books and deluxe editions. I turned the card over. More of the slanted printing on the back. 
Dear Sir, in spite of the legal uncollectability of the enclosed, which frankly represent gambling debts, I assume you might wish them honored. Respectfully, A. G. Geiger I looked at the slips of stiffish white paper. They were promissory notes filled out in ink, dated on several dates early in the month before, September. On demand I promised to pay to Arthur Gwyn Geiger or order the sum of $1,000, $1,000, without interest. Value received. Carmen Sternwood The written part was in a sprawling moronic handwriting with a lot of fat curl accues and circles for dots. I mixed myself another drink and sipped it and put the exhibit aside. Your conclusions? The general asked. I haven't any yet. Who is this Arthur Gwyn Geiger? I haven't the faintest idea. What does Carmen say? I haven't asked her. I don't intend to. If I did, she would suck her thumb and look coy. I said, I met her in the hall. She did that to me. Then she tried to sit in my lap. Nothing changed in his expression. His clasped hands rested peacefully on the edge of the rug, and the heat, which made me feel like a New England boiled dinner, didn't seem to make him even warm. Do I have to be polite? I asked. Or can I just be natural? I haven't noticed that you suffer from many inhibitions. Mr. Marlowe. Do the two girls run around together? I think not. I think they go their separate and slightly divergent roads to perdition. Vivian is spoiled, exacting, smart and quite ruthless. Carmen is a child who likes to pull wings off flies. Neither of them has any more moral sense than a cat. Neither have I. No Sternwood ever had. Proceed. They're well educated, I suppose. They know what they're doing. Vivian went to good schools of the snob type and to college. Carmen went to half a dozen schools of greater and greater liberality, and ended up where she started. I presume they both had, and still have, all the usual vices. If I sound a little sinister as a parent, Mr. Marlowe, it is because my hold on life is too slight to include any Victorian hypocrisy. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes, then opened them again suddenly. I need not add that a man who indulges in parenthood for the first time at the age of 54 deserves all he gets. I sipped my drink and nodded. The pulse in his lean gray throat throbbed visibly and yet so slowly that it was hardly a pulse at all. An old man two-thirds dead and still determined to believe he could take it. Your conclusions? He snapped suddenly. I'd pay him. Why? It's a question of a little money against a lot of annoyance. There has to be something behind it. 
but nobody's going to break your heart, if it hasn't been done already. And it would take an awful lot of chiselers an awful lot of time to rob you of enough so that you'd even notice it. I have pride, sir, he said coldly. Somebody's counting on that. It's the easiest way to fool them. That or the police. Geiger can collect on these notes, unless you can show fraud. Instead of that he makes you a present of them and admits they are gambling debts, which gives you a defense, even if he had kept the notes. If he's a crook, he knows his onions, and if he's an honest man doing a little loan business on the side, he ought to have his money. Who was this Joe Brody you paid the $5,000 to? Some kind of gambler. I hardly recall. Norse would know. My butler. Your daughters have money in their own right, General? Vivian has, but not a great deal. Carmen is still a minor under her mother's will. I give them both generous allowances. I said, I can take this Geiger off your back, General, if that's what you want. Whoever he is and whatever he has. It may cost you a little money, besides what you pay me. And of course it won't get you anything. Sugaring them never does. You're already listed on their book of nice names. I see. He shrugged his wide sharp shoulders in the faded red bathrobe. A moment ago you said pay him. Now you say it won't get me anything. I mean it might be cheaper and easier to stand for a certain amount of squeeze. That's all. I'm afraid I'm rather an impatient man. Mr. Marlowe. What are your charges? I get twenty-five a day in expenses, when I'm lucky. I see. It seems reasonable enough for removing morbid growths from people's backs. Quite a delicate operation. You realize that, I hope. You'll make your operation as little of a shock to the patient as possible. There might be several of them, Mr. Marlowe. I finished my second drink and wiped my lips and my face. The heat didn't get any less hot with the brandy in me. The general blinked at me and plucked at the edge of his rug. Can I make a deal with this guy, if I think he's within hooting distance of being on the level? Yes. The matter is now in your hands. I never do things by halves. I'll take him out, I said. He'll think a bridge fell on him. I'm sure you will. And now I must excuse myself. I am tired. He reached out and touched the bell on the arm of his chair. The cord was plugged into a black cable that wound along the side of the deep dark green boxes in which the orchids grew and festered. He closed his eyes opened them again in a brief bright stare, and settled back among his cushions.
The lids dropped again and he didn't pay any more attention to me. I stood up and lifted my coat off the back of the damp wicker chair and went off with it among the orchids, opened the two doors and stood outside in the brisk October air getting myself some oxygen. The chauffeur over by the garage had gone away. The butler came along the red path with smooth light steps and his back as straight as an ironing board. I shrugged into my coat and watched him come. He stopped about two feet from me and said gravely, Mrs. Regan would like to see you before you leave, sir. And in the matter of money the general has instructed me to give you a check for whatever seems desirable. Instructed you how? He looked puzzled, then he smiled. Ah, I see, sir. You are, of course, a detective. By the way he rang his bell. You write his checks? I have that privilege. That ought to save you from a pauper's grave. No money now, thanks. What does Mrs. Regan want to see me about? His blue eyes gave me a smooth level look. She has a misconception of the purpose of your visit. Sir, who told her anything about my visit? Her windows command the greenhouse. She saw us go in. I was obliged to tell her who you were. I don't like that, I said. His blue eyes frosted. Are you attempting to tell me my duties, sir? Number. But I'm having a lot of fun trying to guess what they are. We stared at each other for a moment. He gave me a blue glare and turned away. Chapter 3 This room was too big. The ceiling was too high, the doors were too tall, and the white carpet that went from wall to wall looked like a fresh fall of snow at Lake Arrowhead. There were full-length mirrors and crystal doodads all over the place. The ivory furniture had chromium on it, and the enormous ivory drapes lay tumbled on the white carpet a yard from the windows. The white made the ivory look dirty and the ivory made the white look bled out. The windows stared towards the darkening foothills. It was going to rain soon. There was pressure in the air already. I sat down on the edge of a deep soft chair and looked at Mrs. Regan. She was worth a stare. She was trouble. She was stretched out on a modernistic chaise long with her slippers off, so I stared at her legs in the sheer silk stockings. They seemed to be arranged to stare at. They were visible to the knee and one of them well beyond. The knees were dimpled, not bony and sharp. The calves were beautiful, the ankles long and slim and with enough melodic line for a tone poem. She was tall and rangy and strong looking. Her head was against an ivory satin cushion. Her hair was black and wiry and parted in the middle and she had the hot black eyes of the portrait in the hall. She had a good mouth and a good chin. 
There was a sulky droop to her lips and the lower lip was full. She had a drink. She took a swallow from it and gave me a cool level stare over the rim of the glass. So you're a private detective, she said. I didn't know they really existed, except in books. Or else they were greasy little men snooping around hotels. There was nothing in that for me. So I let it drift with the current. She put her glass down on the flat arm of the chaise long and flashed an emerald and touched her hair. She said slowly, How did you like Dad? I liked him, I said. He liked Rusty. I suppose you know who Rusty is? Huh? Rusty was earthy and vulgar at times, but he was very real. And he was a lot of fun for Dad. Rusty shouldn't have gone off like that. Dad feels very badly about it, although he won't say so. Or did he? He said something about it. You're not much of a gusher, are you, Mr. Marlowe? But he wants to find him, doesn't he? I stared at her politely through a pause. Yes and no, I said. That's hardly an answer. Do you think you can find him? I didn't say I was going to try. Why not try the Missing Persons Bureau? They have the organization. It's not a one-man job. Oh, Dad wouldn't hear of the police being brought into it. She looked at me smoothly across her glass again, emptied it and rang a bell. A maid came into the room by a side door. She was a middle-aged woman with a long yellow gentle face, a long nose, no chin, large wet eyes. She looked like a nice old horse that had been turned out to pasture after long service. Mrs. Regan waved the empty glass at her and she mixed another drink and handed it to her and left the room, without a word, without a glance in my direction. When the door shut Mrs. Regan said, Well, how will you go about it then? How and when did he skip out? Didn't Dad tell you? I grinned at her with my head on one side. She flushed. Her hot black eyes looked mad. I don't see what there is to be cagey about, she snapped. And I don't like your manners. I'm not crazy about yours, I said. I didn't ask to see you. You sent for me. I don't mind your ritzing me or drinking your lunch out of a scotch bottle. I don't mind your showing me your legs. They're very swell legs and it's a pleasure to make their acquaintance. I don't mind if you don't like my manners. They're pretty bad. I grieve over them during the long winter evenings. But don't waste your time trying to cross-examine me. She slammed her glass down so hard that it slopped over on an ivory cushion. 
She swung her legs to the floor and stood up with her eyes sparking fire and her nostrils wide. Her mouth was open and her bright teeth glared at me. Her knuckles were white. People don't talk like that to me, she said thickly. I sat there and grinned at her. Very slowly she closed her mouth and looked down at the spilled liquor. She sat down on the edge of the chaise long and cupped her chin in one hand. My God, you big dark handsome brute. I ought to throw a Buick at you. I snicked a match on my thumbnail and for once it lit. I puffed smoke into the air and waited. I loathe masterful men, she said. I simply loathe them. Just what is it you're afraid of, Mrs. Regan? Her eyes widened. Then they darkened until they seemed be all pupil. Her nostrils looked pinched. That wasn't what he wanted with you at all, she said in a strained voice that still had shreds of anger clinging to me. About Rusty. Was it? Better ask him. She flared up again. Get out. Damn you, get out. I stood up. Sit down. She snapped. I sat down. I flicked a finger at my palm and waited. Please, she said. Please. You could find Rusty, if Dad wanted you to. That didn't work either. I nodded and asked, when did he go? One afternoon a month back. He just drove away in his car without saying a word. They found the car in a private garage somewhere. They? She got cunning. Her whole body seemed to go lax. Then she smiled at me winningly. He didn't tell you then. Her voice was almost gleeful, as if she bad outsmarted me. Maybe she had. He told me about Mr. Regan, yes. That's not what he wanted to see me about. Is that what you've been trying to get me to say? I'm sure I don't care what you say. I stood up again. Then I'll be running along. She didn't speak. I went over to the tall white door I had come in at. When I looked back she had her lip between her teeth and was worrying it like a puppy at the fringe of a rug. I went out, down the tile staircase to the hall, and the butler drifted out of somewhere with my hat in his hand. I put it on while he opened the door for me. You made a mistake, I said. Mrs. Regan didn't want to see me. He inclined his silver head and said politely, I'm sorry, sir. I make many mistakes. He closed the door against my back. I stood on the step breathing my cigarette smoke and looking down a succession of terraces with flower beds and trim trees to the high iron fence with gilt spears that hemmed in the estate. 
a winding driveway drop down between retaining walls to the open iron gates. Beyond the fence the hill sloped for several miles. On this lower level faint and far off I could just barely see some of the old wooden derricks of the oil flout from which the Sternwoods had made their money. Most of the field was public park now, cleaned up and donated to the city by General Sternwood. But a little of it was still producing in groups of wells pumping five or six barrels a day. The Sternwoods, having moved up the hill, could no longer smell the stale sump water or the oil, but they could still look out of their front windows and see what had made them rich. If they wanted to. I didn't suppose they would want to. I walked down a brick path from terrace to terrace, followed along inside the fence and so out of the gates to where I had left my car under a pepper tree on the street. Thunder was crackling in the foothills now and the sky above them was purple black. It was going to rain hard. The air had the damp foretaste of rain. I put the top up on my convertible before I started downtown. She had lovely legs. I would say that for her. They were a couple of pretty smooth citizens, she and her father. He was probably just trying me out. The job he had given me was a lawyer's job. Even if Mr. Arthur Gwyn Geiger, Rare Books and Deluxe Editions, turned out to be a blackmailer, it was still a lawyer's job. Unless there was a lot more to it than met the eye. At a casual glance I thought I might have a lot of fun finding out. I drove down to the Hollywood Public Library and did a little superficial research in a stuffy volume called Famous First Editions. Half an hour of it made me need my lunch.